Um, so let me get started uh, while the other attendees join in. Um, my name is Varun Malik. Uh, I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is new age in the sense that we took a different approach to setting up a consulting firm. Uh, rather than hiring our own consultant, we partnered with a lot of boutique consulting firms. So we partner at this point with more, more than 350 boutique consulting firms from all across the globe uh, that deliver projects that, that we win in the ecosystem. Um, this summit is a part of Connected Insights, uh, where 70 of the boutique consulting firms in our ecosystem have collaborated to uh, bring their expertise, bring panelists like uh, Pete and Sunando and Radwa to share their insight and their thoughts uh, on various uh, topical subjects, uh, given, uh, given the situation that we all find ourselves in after COVID and in an attempt for all of us to get back on track. Um, that's about it from me. Uh, feel free to, if, uh, if you've noticed, we've permitted talking. So feel free to, uh, during the discussion, if you wanna raise your hand, if you wanna put a question on the chat and we might pull you in to ask a question to one of the panelists, we will leave some time at the end of the panel for questions as well. Uh, that's about it from me, Gary. Uh, looking forward to this discussion. Handing over to Gary from Lynchpin Analytics, uh, who we've been collaborating with for the last few months, and uh, actually more than a year now, and looking forward to this discussion. Thanks, Varun, and uh, welcome everyone to the, the panel today on Make Your Analytics Strategy Customer-Centric. Um, uh, and thanks, Varun, for going through some, some general housekeeping. So as Varun says, very keen to get your engagement. Thank you all for um, joining us today. Um, appreciate your time. Um, like to capture some of your thoughts. So there's a, a Q&A function in Zoom. So please, please use that. And if you feel you want to ask something, then, then do raise your hand um, as well. We'll try to add those questions as we go along. We might have some time at the end to ask some questions. Um, so I look, I think this is a really exciting um, panel discussion. Uh, and as always, I look forward to talking and taking every opportunity to talk through uh, data and analytics strategies um, and the benefits really of a, a customer centric approach. Um, I think it's a fairly complex topic, um, but I think with this panel, we're going to hear some some great ideas and some some great strategies that hopefully you can all take forward into your own organizations and, and use that in, in the coming weeks, days and months. Um, I guess it'd be useful to start with some introductions. Um, uh, brief, I'll go very briefly. Um, so my name is Gary and I'm a strategy and engineering director at a company called Lynchpin Analytics. Um, we're based um, in the UK um, and we've got clients worldwide. So for the past 16 years, I've been focused on helping clients get the best out of their data. Um, and that's through either data science or data engineering solutions, depending on the need that they have. So for me, um, data strategies, analytics strategies, or in fact, more often than, than not, lack of those um, have been central to my, my role throughout, throughout the years. Um, my personal background is, you know, I've worked a lot agency side and client side, so I see the pain points um, from both of those perspectives. Um, I guess I spent a lot of time in financial services uh, and doing analytics roles in that um, area. But actually, you know, I happen to think that the challenges for data and analytics are universal to, to all industries. Um, there might be some nuances, but um, the same problems keep on, keep on cropping up. Um, so really looking forward to this panel um, discussion. Enough from me. What I'd like to do now is um, ask the panel um, to do some brief introductions and then we'll get into the conversation. So um, if I could ask Ranwa for an introduction and then Sanando and then Pete and then we can begin. Thank you so much, Gary. And uh, I'm really glad to be um, with this lovely crowd. Uh, my name is Radha Hassan. I'm the co-founder of um, management consultancy and leadership development uh, startup. Um, and I had the marketing and communications there as well. 
before that, um, I spent 20 years uh, in tech marketing between IBM and Hitachi, leading teams uh, through digital transformation, uh, marketing, uh, um, innovation. Um, and I'm really passionate about the digital transformation and uh, customer centric approach to this digital economy that we're in. And I think we are in the perfect timing, of course, not because of the pandemic, of course, but because of all the changes that took place because of that. And data is at the center of attention, definitely for that. So I really look forward to an engaging discussion. Over to you, Sananda. Uh, thank you, Radva. And uh, again, uh, thank you uh, for having me here. I'm really uh, pleased to be here amongst uh, uh, data enthusiasts, should I call, uh, if, if people have dialed in to, to listen to us and to everybody else. And my background is I've been into IT and consulting uh, for the last 20 odd years and uh, had the luxury of working with uh, fairly large brands like IBM, HP, and then uh, KPMG, the consulting space. So I've been seeing the same kind of a, a challenge and need. Data is also a challenge and data is also a need for everywhere you go. And there's a, and I, again, we don't need to show numbers, but I'm sure everybody is aware of the amount of data that gets generated every day around the world or even within every organization how it is structured, how it's analyzed, what makes sense of it, how do we make sense out of it? I think that's really the, the challenge we all face in our everyday life. And so that's why I, I think that's why we are all here and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk and discuss and, and learn a few things, all of us together here. So looking forward to you. Over to you, Pete. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Pete Lysak. I'm based in Jeddah. I am head of marketing and digital for a low-cost airline. It's a startup we have launched three years ago. The name is Fly Uh We set it up. I'm a founding member, employee number 13. <clears throat> so I've been part of the, uh, of the whole development and setup of the airline, which is always very exciting. We built it in about eight months and we have by now 10 million passengers flown. In, previously, I was uh, doing another startup in Riyadh of a, of, a, of a digital telco in an app. My background is in uh, on the agency side. I was managing director of creative agencies in a number of markets for McCann. And, uh, I was running Coke in Africa, advertising Coke in Africa. So um, that's my background is more on this side, on brands, on marketing strategies. And I find what's happening with data absolutely fascinating, how you can build insights, how you can understand what's happening, how digital marketing works based on data. Uh, Flyview has been launched purely in digital. So uh, that's a topic very close to my heart. And even though I'm not a hardcore analytics guy, I absolutely love analytics. I live on analytics day in, day out. Thank you all. Um... Uh, so I think what's clear here is I can hear the, the passion from all three of you around data and analytics. Um, so I think this is going, going to be a, a great discussion. Um, I'd like to start, I guess, in, in general terms, you know, um, I think, Sanando, for example, you mentioned just now the, the increasing amount of data that we're capturing in general across, across, across the world. Um, and it's clear to me when I talk to the management community that, um, you know, data and analytics is seen potentially as a differentiator for businesses looking to carve out advantage. And there's many reasons for which businesses are looking to adopt a data and analytics strategy or to think about data and analytics projects. Um, and often that can be around, for example, digital transformation. I think that was mentioned a few moments ago. So this keen to understand um, from the panel just now what in your experience you've seen as a trigger for data and analytics and, and what you know people will use to to spark that data and analytics uh, roadmap. Um, um, do you want me to start or? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely uh, spot on, Gary. I think what's happening is, uh, yes, as I mentioned, enormous amount of data is getting generated, but but how do we make the data turn into a utility and then move it to an enabler and a driver for the business? And I think that's that's where that's where most organizations are 
struggling. And that's where they, there is an amount of data, but how do you make the data into information and then move the information as an asset, which effectively drives your business or enables your business to move forward. And that's where I think it's, it's, a, it's a constant challenge because, and a, and a huge amount of, not only huge amount of data getting generated, huge amount of demand for data analytics and data analytics, you know, engineers and uh, uh, people who are, who are doing their studies in that. So I, I personally think that anything, and I think this, this is a, a, a very old statement, what you can't measure, you can't improve. So that's what data provides you. You did, data provides you with the information that you're looking for to enhance. If be, it can be operational excellence, it can be customer intimacy, it can be you know innovation. So all, all these things, I think everybody is trying to uh, enhance and not, not to also forget risk management because especially in the last one year, I think we've all, all seen the amount of you know, cyber attacks and all gone up. So in a, anything that you want to enhance in, as an organization or as a business, data is, is key. So you start looking at the data, you start looking at identifying the, your, your key drivers, which can enhance your, be it digital transformation, be it, and, and, and Pete touched upon, uh, you know, starting digitally. If you're starting a company digitally, you can't do it without data. So I think it's, it's the key at this point in time. How do you look at data and how do you, you know, make sense out of it? That's where most organizations are struggling because you, it's, it's all nice uh, to build, you know, digital strategies, but digital strategies cannot work without the right data information that flows in. So if the data is not there, you might have a nice fancy, you know, PowerPoint slides and consultants do that all the time, but, really you're not measuring anything you're not actually developing anything so uh, i think it's 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 the key how you measure it what, are you measuring the right thing and how do you measure it and 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 i think everybody knows this why are you measuring it if you if you don't know why you're measuring it then don't measure it or don't do anything for that matter so i'll, I'll let the others uh, uh, have their opinion as well. Adwa? Yeah, so um, I, I definitely echo everything uh, Sananda said. And, and of course, ending on asking the why is very, very critical. So to start off with the why we're, we're measuring this data and what will this data um, do for the company and for the customers. So building all these blocks together and making this clear to everyone. So when we talk about a data-driven culture, you cannot have it just at the top and have the management just say, we're gonna have a data-driven culture and, and that's it. But you need to elaborate and explain and have transparency with all the engaged stakeholders that be even the fresh people who join a company. So making that clear and explaining how will this data impact the success of the organization and the clients so that the engagement would be definitely much higher from everyone. And the other thing that's really important as senior leaders in companies is that when they try to create this data-driven culture, they need to use it. So it really doesn't matter if you have a data-driven engine or technology that you wouldn't use yourself and you would stick to your legacy reports that you feel like really uh, attached to and that they satisfy certain areas of your management system and then you don't want to use the technology because that creates some sort of disconnect between what you're trying to achieve and this holistic uh, uh, view of a, of a culture in the organization. So that's really, really critical. Again, the consistency in using it. So you have to be consistent. You don't try it one time and then you just drop it out. Uh, so showing the impact and the results is very critical because that's what encourages the behavior of believing in the value of having a data-driven culture and on the long term in the digital transformation so it doesn't become a buzzword that nobody is relating to so this is one of the things that i i, I see very very important so it takes accountability and transparency from leadership it starts at the top but when it goes down you need to explain 
why we're doing it. And when it goes to the customer centricity and, and how the customers are going to embrace that, we explain it and we show the value. So. Mm. I, I feel, I have to say, I feel very privileged because, you know, we have set up a startup airline that's digital at the core. So in a way, uh, it's a no brainer that we live through data and data is our daily currency. Whether this is, you know, we, we uh, of course, we have physical aircraft and we fly people, right? But apart from that, uh, we sell purely through digital channels and it's direct. So whether this is our website or the app, we launch airline purely in digital, which is I think the first in the world. And um, data is our daily bread. This, we, we can't live without data. I get slightly annoyed when I hear the word digital transformation because I know how painful and difficult and very often unsuccessful this is. And if you build a business like ours, which is digital at the core, you really have no choice but to look at data and make decisions based on data and uh, do intuitive leaps as well based on data. Uh, so for us, there's no question of, um, you know, should we use data or how do we have data strategy? It's uh, like the air that we breathe in a way, which is awesome because um, that completely changes your, your mindset and how you look at things. So there's no decision or no movement done without data, whether this is Google Analytics that we have on big screens you know, in front of us, whether this is a passenger booking system that gives us all the information about passengers, whether this is AIMS, which gives us information about what's happening currently with the flights and who is boarded and who is not boarded and you know, who has arrived, who has not arrived, and so on and so on. Uh, and all of it meshed together, if you start looking at, at uh, data and the connections that you can um, find out everyone has Power BI open throughout the day. Uh, this is a wonderful world uh, with incredible visibility. I remember years ago when I was starting marketing, I had a friend who said, I want to do, invent like this big uh, mechanical engine, you know, for marketing. When I push one button here, I get results from the other side. Well, that's exactly what we have, you know, in my, my part, which is marketing. Everything is visible on a daily basis. We manage this uh, live. It's uh, quite, quite something. Thank you all. Um, I'm just going to explore a little bit about um, digital transformation. Um, I think Pete, you mentioned just now, for example, that obviously you, you're running a digital um, airline and you talked about digital transformation perhaps failing. Um, I wonder if you can talk through the reasons for why digital transformations might fail. Um, because I guess a lot, of, a lot of businesses who are not digital first, but might struggle then to begin to adopt data and analytics in the same way that you have being digital first. Mm. There are a couple of thoughts here. So first of all, any transformation, any change requires a real pain. You need to be in a real pain, you need to resolve to go into transformation, into change, right? So very often uh, business would say, well, we want to be digital, which is, you know, the world we live in is digital, right? Our personal world, it's, it's completely meshed, right? So uh, that already tells you that this is kind of a bit of a false premise. And very often the business that has grown uh, through being, you know, a non-digital uh, business uh, would have to be dismantled to the core and reassembled really. So ideally, I always think, you know, it's better to build it from scratch with digital at the center and, you know, at the core, than try to transform it. Uh, and then uh, obviously there are things like, you know, uh, the investment, change of habits, you know, people's uh, egos or people's um, little kingdoms, you know, because when you go into data, suddenly everything is in the open and many skeletons in the closets are visible. I have seen that in one, one company that actually can't hide anything because everything is out in the open. So there will be obviously a resistance. Some people might be not suitable anymore. There is, you know, possibly there is human cost as well, right? So there's a whole bunch of, 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 of roadblocks in, uh, in what you call digital transformation. And um, I guess we have all seen it once okay. in a while. Um, the example that was given of Uber, right? Uh, he's not here, but that was exactly my point. It was, it was disruptive uh, I, digital idea. It was not transformative, right? So they started, they just, 
broken uh, fixedness of the of the taxi industry and they have completely reinvented it looking at the pain points and and facilitators they reinvented the experience i think this is really the way to go uh Sinandu, do you have thoughts on, on that um i guess an interesting point there at the end about disruption versus change um and you know uh, the uber example there being being one where they've managed to come in and disrupt completely yeah, I think there are uh, quite a few stories about disruption. I mean, um, the you know the Netflix being one of them, and 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 quite a few of them. Over obviously, uh, when when you see how it started, the, it it was uh, uh, the 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 person who built Uber. He was just uh, waiting for a taxi, and he drew a picture on his napkin, and that's the birth of Uber. And uh, so yes, uh, these these kind of changes when anybody a disruption comes into the business the i think digital transformation is so much easier and and i uh, completely echo pete's thought that sometimes changing a normal uh, a running business uh, suddenly just a fancy term digital transformation or business transformation doesn't work so easily it's it's really it, you need to start thinking and if i if i take an example even from from the current industry that I'm working in, I'm working with the with the events business, and if not, then the travel industry, the biggest uh, setback, I think, the industry which had last year was the events industry, because there were no events, uh, starting from the you know the football games to uh, corporate events to everything got stopped, so. Did, but but did the events industry stop? No. Organizations like IBM and Microsoft uh, announced they are going to do the next three years everything virtually, or everything. And and so so the the again why I gave this example was the mindset. There was a way of doing events. People used to fly to a nice fancy location, a five star resort, and and spend a couple of days with the with the significant amount of money spent in and. Uh, and 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 do some you know and and go through a conference attend a conference but people had to very quickly change the entire model by putting things virtually and and people pretty much getting the same information with very very less cost and being in the comfort of their home no travel so it it was actually another disruption example of disruption which change the entire events industry in a different i'm not saying that physical events are going to stop and and i'm sure they'll come back uh, but there is a there is an alternate option which came out of it so it's it's sometimes thinking digitally and starting with that might be a easier way to digitally transform than trying to or or really uh, the the and i know i'm i'm getting into a a subject which might get very big the culture of an organization where you might have to really really uh, from top down come in and and look at why we are doing digital in transformation and and driven through top but i I'll, I'll stop by just saying if digital transformation can work well and with data and analytics if people can link or the chiefs i uh, mean the ceos of organizations can link their vision with the value proposition and the outcome if they can merge this join these together and and have a clear communication with that and using data as an input i think digital transformation can work thanks nando um Radha, do you have anything else <laughs> so again on the digital transformation um i see it as a, as a journey and, and again, back to the why. So everything Sanando has said um, and on, on this respect on what fills and what really, um, uh, what really works with, the, with digital transformation uh, because you need to break it down into little world words of how it impacts each function in the organization, the finance, the operations, the marketing and how it's going to impact the employee and, uh, and the customer. And, and the consistency, um, because some of the digital transformation projects fail because they're not linked to the
um, there's not enough ownership and accountability to the failure or to change the way moving forward when you hit bumps. So um, now I think one of the upsides of the pandemic was the acceleration of the digital transformation. I mean, if we owe anything good to the pandemic is that it had opened the customer's eyes to the immediate need to work on the digital transformation uh, strategies. Because I've seen some, some customers would say that's like, oh, we still have 10 more years to go, or it's not really urgent, or we can just work on some small projects when it comes to digital transformation and we can pilot it. But they did not really own it very seriously. And that's why some customers and some companies um, have, 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 I wouldn't say failed, but have been beaten by their competitors those who have adopted a serious approach to digital transformation. Okay, th thanks all. Um, there's a, an interesting question popped up in our q and I wonder if we can have, have a look at that just now. How do we know um, that a company is ready for digital transformation or for big data analytics? If, if I may say, if I may uh, try and answer, I'm sure uh, the others would join in. The, the key uh, thing that I would say is first, they should have an open culture and something we touched upon, acceptance of the, the truth or the reality or the data that's coming out. So if, if that open mindset is there, if, if people accept what they are actually looking at, I think that itself is a huge driver for for digital transformation or the readiness for a digital transformation. And then uh, acceptance of change. That if from tomorrow, if you have to start thinking digitally and do something digitally, the, the acceptance from change, which again needs to be, uh, you know, a top down approach. If these two things are, are there. So effectively what I'm saying is I'm not talking about any technology. I'm not talking about anything. If the intent is there, effectively what I'm saying, if the intent is there, really, I think a company is ready for digital transformation or even ready for data analytics. Yeah. Okay, I think um, what's interesting is that um, in this discussion already, we've touched on um, a few times, and I think you just highlighted it there, the, the role of culture um, and, and the role that that plays in driving forwards a data-driven mindset in an organization. Um, I often hear companies wanting to become data-driven and I'm sometimes not sure what that means or they, they don't really know what that means. Um, I'm, I guess I'm keen to understand um, what you think the, the leaders in the business need to do to help change or uh, um, modify culture so that analytics can thrive and what the qualities of a good leader would be. Um, Radbud, I'd be keen to start with you, um, I think, given your expertise so, in this, this sorry, area. Sorry, Gary, it, it broke up um, the last few seconds. Sure, I just want to understand, um, in order to bring forward a data-driven mindset in a business and to change the culture in an organization to support analytics, what a good leader needs to do, what, what the qualities are for good leadership and to drive that forward. Yeah. So um, being marketing and communications, I would just like be a little bit biased to that, not to the marketing, but rather to the part of the communications. Any change in an organization starts with communication. So as a leader, you have to first own the communication and what you want to deliver as a message internally and explain really why we're doing this and how it's going to impact. So building a solid communication strategy long term throughout the project of the digital transformation or even for the data driven to build this mindset um, is very critical. And this communication strategy would definitely include celebrating the outcomes and of course, awarding all those early adapters or those who are following through the strategy, bringing innovation. So this is very, very key for a leader to do also, the regular interlocks with the team just to identify any roadblocks and to see where are we going and to have the accountability coming from the leader and not throw it at the, the teams who are executing or running the data 
uh, driven projects, uh, the, the digital transformation projects, for example. Um, this is very, very key because it's, it's uh, I would say it's an operation that needs to have everybody chip, chipping in uh, for that. So that's uh, really one of the elements when it comes to the communication and to the follow the follow through. So I wouldn't want to call it cadencing, but going through the progress of the project uh, very very well. Um, so yeah, I, I I think as a communication helps really well with that. Um, I would also put it in terms of, let's say, push and pull, right? So first of all, there should be a push from the top saying, okay, I, I uh, authorize and demand uh, resourcing and focus on that and I prioritize it. So that we push, but in terms of the pull, you know, if there's decisions being made or if there's discussions being had, you know, is it, is it supported by data? I mean, why, why would you, or why would we do it? You know, uh, why would we go into a, a new project, why would we, um, I don't know, uh, choose this strategy or another strategy, uh, data-based. And then obviously it's not just analytics, which is wonderful and, and you go, can go deeper and deeper and deeper and keep asking questions, but also there is a leap, right? So once you get your, uh, your bits of data, then there is a creative leap required. So for instance, with us, you know, we have in our data, I see that we have a very large number of customers that book uh, last minute and book one way. Why is that? You know, can you say that? Can you tell this from data? Where are they? You know, is it is it Tabuk to Jeddah or is it uh, Damam to Jazan? And uh, then I look at our data, what is the reason they are flying? And I look at our data, which is, you know, what age they are at, and how many of them fly together and so on. And it starts to form a picture. So this is wonderful. And the other thing is you can then uh, go into uh, develop, uh, you know, cluster analysis and look at those clusters and something extremely surprising can turn out that you actually some data is connecting to each other. What picture does it give you? Obviously you can go further into research or understanding, you know, what's happening there. But I think this adventure of discovery, if you have plenty of data and you can actually put any data together that you want to, you know, and you go on this fishing trip trying to, you know, find out what is the, 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 the fish at the end of the line. Uh, that's incredibly inspiring and can really form uh, powerful, powerful strat insights and powerful strategies based on that. Uh, if, I, if I may just add, I think as a leader, any leader who is trying to drive digital transformation or a culture change needs to accept what's not only what is coming from data, but also the, uh, the if, if there are any drawbacks in the business, in the current operating model, if, if, the, if the leader is ready for acceptance, the leader is ready to get feedback from irrespective, which uh, Radwa touched upon, where you know, it's not about uh, trying to uh, just uh, uh, overpower the team who are doing the work or something like that. And they, they, they accept what the reality is and, and are ready to accept that change. I think that behavior or that culture, if, if shown right from the top, it, it would definitely work. And it, it has to be driven top down because if the leadership doesn't acknowledge what they are trying to do, then uh, the, the, information would not percolate and, and uh, people will not buy into what the organization is trying to achieve. There has to be certain compromises. There has to be certain feedback loop. There has to be a 360 degree view. There has to be, uh, uh, which I touched upon earlier, you know, the, the, the outcomes have to be very clearly articulated. It's not about always outputs. It has to be the outcomes. Which, which need to be very clearly articulated that that's what we are going to get in a year down the line, two years down the line, five years down the line. And, and if, if that kind of a, a clear vision, communication, something again, both the panelists touched upon, I think if, if those things come out from a leader, definitely an organization can change. I'd like to end with an example, which was uh, because uh, maybe from my past IBM experience, uh, when IBM was about to kind of uh, going going down back in the 90s, 
uh, so uh, it it completely turned around the way it turned around you have to accept the realities you have to tell the truth and then you 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 see things you know moving uh, moving forward and and changing uh, and today ibm is uh, if not the biggest one of the biggest organizations in the world so yeah okay so well, thank thank you it's, it's very clear um from from that discussion that um leadership is, is is important and getting that right through communication through that top down approach and and really being clear on, on outcomes are all crucial so i think that that's one side of or one important component of an analytics strategy i think another fairly obvious one that we've i guess talked about in some sense today is, is data itself you know and in some ways um data is the lifeblood of, of analytics. Um, I think there are some big moves um, happening at the moment. So for example, in the digital space, there's a move um, for various complex reasons we might or might not discuss in terms of ownership of data, moving to, to first party data. Uh, and also you've got in the background, the, the prevalence of cloud computing and, and obviously um, gathering data at scale and, and at low cost. Um, I guess I'm keen to understand, um, you know, the importance uh, that you might place on, on a data strategy to support analytics. Um, I think Peter might be good to start with you because you've obviously been building up a, a digital first, um, a digital airline. And so mm -hmm. I guess data has been one of the things you've thought about from, from day one. Yeah. So, yeah, of course, data protection. I mean, we are not part of, of EU, but we are following pretty much the lead of what's happening there. Uh, it's we we, uh, we own the data. We don't buy data. Uh, and there is very high security protocols on that that uh, IT is implementing. Uh, I'm not an IT and data guy, so I probably would, won't be able to give you more technical detail. Um, but um, you know we have clear structure of data and the data is is clean or cleansed um, the data is uh, currency on everyday uh, basis it's dispersed among the teams so it's a bit of a matrix structure everyone is dependent on data in their own uh, little field um, it's very much a cultural thing like we're saying obviously um, yeah, uh, and in the end, you know, it's just a powerful feed, right, into into our everyday lives. Thank you, um, Sanando. I guess you've got a strong, uh, rich background in, in um, IT. Yes. Yeah, so uh, obviously, uh, there's a lot of uh, debate and discussion around the world. We know what happened uh, in Australia and things like that, and we'll not go there. With, with the big tech companies but uh, but but the fact is uh, yes there are data protocols which are uh, in, in different parts of the world i think everybody is coming up with their own protocols uh, gdpr was uh, spoken about however uh, it it is i think the organization's responsibility also in in whichever form first party or third party data that they are collecting needs to be uh, needs to be retained and how retained uh, what can you store what you cannot store and things like that most countries have come up with some some regulations and, and privacy privacy requirements cloud obviously something that you you highlighted yes cloud is prevalent and not every country has access to their own uh, cloud within the country or within their regulatory, uh, you know, parameters. This is this is the challenge that another challenge which uh, I would say more so in in this part of the world where we are at this point in time. Me, myself, Pete, uh, Radwa, uh, we we have this this challenge in in this part of the world where uh, uh, cloud infrastructures are yes they are growing slowly, but but they're still not uh, so prevalent as as say either the east or the west um so so these are challenges which which need to be uh people need to be educated about this 
organizations need to establish some data management regulations or data literacy, if you would like to call it, where how uh, there are, this data literacy can be of, of two, two ways. One is, is how you educate your people to understand, analyze, work on the data. That's one part of it. The second, the other side of the, the one we are discussing is how do you retain data? What do you do with the data? What can you do and what you cannot do with the data? So, so as, as not only as, as IT, I think as a business, people need to understand what's the value of the data that's coming in and what can we do and what we cannot do with that. So if it, it has to be a, a data literacy program within the organization at, at a certain level where people realize and understand and use the data in, in the right and appropriate way. Um, Radha? Um, yeah, um, so the usage of data and the importance and the value of data, it's something that definitely needs to be highlighted, but also understanding which parts of data that you would need to keep. So data being really important, but just extracting oil. Either is pure, and I'm not an expert there, but I mean, there are different things that come out of the oil that you use differently and have value. So same is for data. And if we say that data is the new oil, then you would need to check what exactly that you would use that would impact your business. So customer data, for example, how are you going to use the customer data? Uh, uh, data about your products and their usage. Um, I would um, mention here uh, Fortnite. I'm not a user for Fortnite, uh, but the company that has developed Fortnite is hooked up to AWS uh, for the cloud system. And in real time, they get feedback on the usage and the feedback of the satisfaction of the users. And they take that just immediately and try to develop new features that would satisfy the clients. So this is a type of data usage that really impacts your product innovation, the customer satisfaction, different ways that really impacts the, the brand and the organization. Um, and, and back to Sananda's uh, point, although yes, we're struggling here a little bit, uh, or we're just a bit behind the uh, cloud journey, it's in the uh, East and the West, uh, but still here, uh, the big players have recognized the, the value of having their data centers in the region. And there has been a, a, a massive improvement there. And we have data centers in Bahrain. We have data centers in uh, Qatar that are coming up for Google and also in Saudi and here in the UE for Microsoft. So I, I think as we move forward in the coming two years, there will be better setups for companies, small and big, uh, for the data residency. And uh, that will definitely make government uh, accounts more confident about keeping their data in the region here and adopting the cloud journey. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, some, some really interesting points there and, and the, the things you touched on there in regards of, of the cloud investment. So I think we've talked about culture as, as a key component. We've talked about um, data is obviously a key component to any analytics strategy. Um, and I think that's an interesting um, example you gave on Fortnite, something uh, close to, to my heart because um, it impacts our data usage in this house and, um, and their adoption and investment in analytics to drive forward um, and improve the customer experience. I guess one, one thing I'd be keen to, to understand, we talked about it at the beginning really, is the connection between you know, investment in analytics and value. Um, and people, you know, um, using it well and understanding what they're using it for. Um, often I hear that there's a disparity in investment and actually people getting something back that's of value. So you know, are the reports making sense? Are we actually learning anything new? Um, I begin to understand, you know, how, how we make that connection between, you know, just you can invest money in cloud, you can invest money in um, changing culture, maybe, but then how do you actually make, um, how do you deliver ROI on analytics and how would you measure that? Can I go first? Yeah. So I'm going to go directly into media, which is you know part of my marketing remit. Uh, purely in digital, there's no other communication that we do. Everything is in social, in digital, in search, All this is all that we use. 
So obviously launching an airline, there's an investment. Uh, our marketing investment was probably, I would say less than one tenth of what, of what I would expect using non-digital media. So we have uh, launched before we went on sale, actually. So we did lots of teasing and lots of preps. When we opened for sale, we sold 10,000 tickets within the first 24 hours. And actually our daily inventory at that point was 742 tickets so or seats. So we sold 10,000 seats in the first 24 hours. It was unbelievable when we opened it and we did the countdown and we pressed the button, you know, open the, the, um, our digital channels for sales. It just started flooding. It was incredible. Now, if you take investment, marketing investment, or let's say media, digital media investment uh, in the first few months, let's say, let's take the first six months, at 100%, within a year, we reduced it to 4%. So the savings were not only we have started off with a low base, the savings were absolutely staggering. So a simple, you know, focus on analytics and understanding what's happening with our marketing, how we target, how we retarget, and you know, how we drive efficiencies or effectiveness, gave us the cost per seat, that's how I calculate it, at the level that just unheard of in the industry. I mean, this is millions and millions of dollars saved with investment that's relatively low because lots of it just available, let's say, mostly let's say Google Analytics that we look at and, you know, and, and uh, whatever, you know, AdWords are offering, et cetera, et cetera. So those are really commodity uh, offerings, nothing tailor-made or highly sophisticated. I've never seen it. And the feeling that you have when you actually can real time shift investment, reduce investment, uh, take decisions on that and, you know, the, uh, fuel interest, fuel engagement, uh, uh, fuel sales, and so on, and monitor this real time. That gives you an incredible sense of uh, of uh, control and 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 uh, accomplishment. Thank you, Sanando. Have you seen that um, example of, of value back from analytics? Yes, uh, absolutely, and I think. Uh, value from analytics uh, can be can be derived from uh, i think what what we touched upon yes we, we have the data we we receive it but how do we how do we make sense out of it and then to get an roi effectively we need to have a we need to see the impact of data across the value chain so irrespective of whichever business you are if you're looking at data from across the value chain i think the roi is is derived much easier and you are able to see it at various touch points so the kpis that you would like to define would have to be across the value chain many organizations what uh, to to en ensure that you know the data and analytics strategy actually works have ha have a hub which which tries to generate all the information or all the data within within that area and then allow everybody to use it so if you if organizations who have really enabled and enhanced using data are making data as a service so service not only for their clients but also for their internal uh, users and uh, you know employees because once it it becomes a, a service you can you can see the value in every every part of 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 the data that's getting generated so the amount of self service if if i talk about an organization the amount of self service you can create if if people start actually seeing the data and utilizing the data it it enhances the the business value or the data or the analytics value so much if if kpis can be across the value chain which i mentioned you create a hub, you create a, uh, you make it as a service offering, then it, it would really, I, I believe it would really enhance your, I mean, the, the, the outputs will give you the, the KPIs will be, again, the KPIs can be anything. It can be financial, it can be operational excellence, it can be customer service, irrespective of those. 
but as long as data can be used as a service across all of these, I think it would add value to every part of the business. Okay, thank you. Um, Rab, have you got examples of uh, good value derived from analytics? Uh, well, I, I see the value is, is always when it just reflects on the customer satisfaction and the, the profit. So the value of the data analytics is seen throughout, and, and as Sanando said, throughout the value chain um, and how it can touch on each point of the operation of an organization right? for the customers, for their satisfaction, the engagement, uh, to your sales, uh, for, with the retail as well, with analytics, it's really, really critical and important. And it has shown that it has improved the, the brand uh, value with so many brands with using data analytics, with leveraging more of their uh, offerings or their engagement with their clients as in a more personalized experience. So it, it has a massive value uh, with that also for the leadership to understand um, again to the KPIs, what are our KPIs and how data has impacted or improved uh, the advancement or the achievement of these KPIs. Um, so it's a culture and mindset um, and the journey throughout data uh, proves to be the most valuable element there. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got five minutes left. I'm keen really to focus on customer centricity um, so we've, I guess we've discussed a little bit about customers' expectations evolving. So customers are more demanding of brands. They want personalized um, products and services. They want things at point of need across multiple devices. So we're seeing a, a shift there in how brands um, engage with, with customers or, or vice versa. Um, and what I'd like to do is go around the panel and just understand um, how why it's important to invest in a customer-centric analytics strategy and, and, and what that actually means. We've talked in general terms about analytics strategies, but what do we mean by customer-centric analytics strategy? Um, Pete, could I start with you first? Yeah, I'm going to give you, give you an example that I'm proud of. So um, I have developed, it was actually me and one IT guy, we have developed uh, a very robust NPS, Net Promoter Score system for us understanding that actually NPS's role is to make the entire company customer centric. So we looked at the customer journey, you know, from uh, uh, booking, booking and purchase of the ticket to, uh, you know, checking at the airport, boarding the aircraft, onboard experience, uh, the boarding and customer service. We broke it down into sub questions and each of our customers passengers gets a link to the survey two hours within the arrival. 10% of them actually participate in the survey to give us a rating of zero to 10. And if you know how it works, you know, zero to six is detractors, seven and eight is uh, passives and eight and nine is promoters, sorry, nine and 10 is promoters. And then, you know, depending on the touch point that we ask, why do you recommend us? And the touch point for instance is I don't know because of the cabin or because of the cabin crew experience. So then they get served additional question: Is it uh, the attitude and behavior? Is it the grooming? Is it uh, language skills? Is it this and that? So in the end, we get a powerful, robust dashboard of all kinds of data of what's happening with our customers. Why would they recommend us? Why would they not recommend us? We can assign revenue at risk, uh, revenue secure, based on. You know, because we know exactly who has, who, we, we, we know exactly where the answer comes from. We can uh, analyze it by age, by place of origin, by down to the, to, even to the route, to the flight number taken and the date. So we know exactly what's happening. And uh, this allows us, first of all, to understand how we are doing, what revenue could be at risk, what revenue could be at, uh, what revenue is secure, what actions, what are the key actions to be taken, whether to enhance positives or to address the negatives, that gets distributed across the entire organization. It's uh, also uh, part of the question is reasons to fly. So we understand the motivation, we understand the experience, we understand the role of the touch points, and then we do actionable actions on the findings 
for instance, uh, changing or tweaking cabin bag policy because that was a major, major issue for our passengers. So uh, that has really changed the organizations. It's, it's a data-driven uh, approach for sure. And it has changed the organization completely over the last year. And everyone is just uh, really uh, looking at that part, at their input, their area of responsibility within the customer experience based on uh, NPS touch points. It's a great story. Thank you. Mm. Um, Sanando and Radwa, um, can I ask you um, your answers to that question on customer centricity, um, but conscious of time, we need to be quite quite brief, if you don't mind. Uh, I would I would just take uh, 30 seconds. I, I think uh, Amazon is the best example. You got it there. <laughs> who, who, have, who have shown, exactly. uh, who have shown what, what's, what's customer centricity for data analytics. And, and that's the best example. For me, I, I have uh, just, I would say, three, four things that, that can really drive this. You know, build an outside in customer lifetime value. Don't don't think it one-time customer. Look from a lifetime. Build your culture around your customer. And uh, I, I would say, identify your most valuable customers and 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 focus on them. I'm sure it it would it would increase. It would enhance. It will bring in more customers. And last but not the least, because we are talking about data, it's about better data and not big data. So if, if we can focus on better data, I think we have, we would definitely be focusing uh, more on, on our customers. That's a great comment. Thanks. Um, Radha. Um, in 30 seconds, um, Sonando has just read my mind, I guess. <laughs> he just like said uh, the keyword is Amazon. They're the best in customer centricity. And that's what has made them as the biggest industry disruptors to me in the world. And the best example of a customer-centric company, if you keep Amazon uh, in your focus and you just try to follow what they're doing with having the customer as the center of everything, their uh, feedback, the solving any problem, then you've got it all, all sorted. As a user, whenever you deal with Amazon, you feel like you're important and any problem will be solved because they want to keep you. And that's how companies should be doing. Like you focus on the company, the, uh, on the customer, and not just anything else, not falling in love with your product, but just the customer, fall in love with your customer. You'll just do great. Awesome. That's great advice. Um, thank you all. Um, I guess we're now out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank the panel for the contributions. Um, I'd like to thank the audience as well for, for listening in. It's been a really um, exciting, I think, love to talk about analytics. So it's been a really exciting conversation um, and thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a good evening. You too.